Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Um, today I'm going to be just wrapping up the books I've read this week. Um, and also I've been realising, because so I got a new phone over the holidays, and I realised better in terms of picture quality and in terms of lighting. But in the last couple when I've been editing them, I've just been realising just how like glowy my face ends up being because of this. I think there's probably some kind of midpoint that is better than the previously dreary lighting and not quite where I look like I'm sort of shining. Um, but hopefully this is okay. Um, it's sort of a bit strange to me when I sort of look at the camera as I'm filming and sort of see all of that. So yeah, anyway, uh, so without further ado, let's get on to the books that I've been reading this week. First up, I read The Things That We Lost by Jyoti Patel. Um, and uh, this book is sort of part of uh, Murky Press, uh, Murky Books, who have been uh, really championing new voices, particularly voices from writers of colour. Um, and uh, this sort of is part of their new, one of their new writers from their new Writers' Prize. Um, and uh, what I think was just really exciting about this book is just how it really tapped into some some very interesting family dynamics. The core idea is that we have Nikhil, um, known to many people in the book as Nick, um, and he um, and his mother Avni have to sort of work out the, the sort of dynamic between the two of them because uh, Nick lost his father uh, before he really ever got to know him properly. And so he is on this sort of quest as a young man trying to work out who he is, find out a bit more about um, his identity, where he's come from, um, what kind of secrets are existing within the family. And his mother, Avni, is sort of trying to navigate what she tells and doesn't tell her son, particularly as he's about to go off to uni and various other things, how she navigates this other man who she started dating um, after um, her husband's death, and so, so many other things. And so there's just this really interesting big um, kind of world that she's sort of really trying to understand. Um, and so it's this really complicated thing um, for her where she is trying to balance, you know, accepting her son as a grown man who's able to make his decisions and what that then means for her dynamic with him particularly is the sort of these two people against the world and also sort of recognizing that there is some degree of honesty that she owes him or feels that she owes him and some that she feels is probably better kept hidden um, and so this is really beautiful um, story I think of kind of keeping them together which I just really enjoyed I thought it was just a really well done family drama and um, I think this book is due to come out pretty much I think it's just come out as this video goes live um, so yeah very very exciting. Next up I read An Elderly Lady Must Not Be Crossed uh, by Helen Thurston translated by Marlene Delaghi and um, from my wrap up from uh, sort of favourite backlisted books from last year, I mentioned her first book, um, An Elderly Lady's Up to No Good, um, as one of my favourites. And I just loved the sort of cosy, ridiculous nature of these sort of short stories, which are basically um, an old woman, as the title sort of hints at, um, who goes around committing murder. Um, but it's all done in quite a cosy way, where it's normally people who have really annoyed her. And it's normally, there's almost a sense of like, justice I guess um even if they're not particularly justified if that makes sense you know as in she there's sometimes people who have done wrong and she is sort of rebalancing things by doing this at least in her mind it's not always as clean cut as that sometimes she just doesn't like someone and um this book picks up on where the first one ended in terms of following up on some of the events and in some ways it almost reads like a novel um, in the sense that these short stories are very connected so we learn about something in her history and then next we have actually what happened maybe either next or a few years later or was linked to that um, and it was just a really good fun silly book to read um, it's really well done, um, I think, because it's it sort of ties this line of, oh, how is she going to do this? How is she going to murder them? Because we know that she is. Um, and also there's sort of, there are some really beautiful moments where um, we learn a little bit more about her family, um, although she also sort of tries killing some of them. And But it's also just a really funny set of stories. So it's just, it was a really great, interesting, fun and cosy book for this sort of winter period. Next, I read The Foghorn Echoes by Danny Ramadan. Um, and this is a book I'd kept, I kept on seeing going around bits of book Twitter um, and then also followed the author. So obviously then <laughs> you hear a lot more about the book um, as well. But I think this book is just such a beautiful one. It is, um, it 
it sort of follows these two men who um, sort of following sort of the, the war in Syria start to sort of try to lead new lives. And there's this sort of odd relationship between the two of them. Um, and we follow particularly when one of them, uh, um, Hossam, is in uh, is living in Canada. And so we we suddenly see this man being able to really blossom and have this really openly uh, gay life. Um, to sort of he's really able to celebrate, to be who he is in Vancouver. But actually, not everything is easy. And a few characters around him do say things like, "Well, why why are you complaining? Like this is the most free you've ever been. Um, you're able to do all these things that maybe you weren't able to before." And um, he sort of comes back at them and says, "Well." yes and no like I yeah I'm more free but actually I live with some of the scars and some of the trauma from what I've witnessed and as the the story unravels more and more we start to learn a little bit more about some of the some of what that trauma is what the backstory was that led to to this um to this moment so for example there's a sort of a bit of a backstory about the two men as they were trying to escape there's a bit more of a story about um, him constantly seeing the um, uh, Hossam uh, constantly seeing the face of his father in the middle of moments, and there were some really beautifully heartbreaking moments in this book, um, including, for example, um, him being involved in chemsex, so sort of sex whilst sort of on various sort of drugs and things that kind of inhibit your ability to make proper decisions, and even then he's having these um, these visions of seeing his father and. Um, you know, so so many harrowing, haunting things happening to him in this in this book, and it, it's just there was something about the way that was observed that I found really interesting. Because so I listened to this as an audio book, and it, at times I'd just be really swept away by the the way that we would have a scene that was sudden that would start off feeling really liberated and free and sexual and and everything, and then very quickly pivot into something really quite dark and tragic and full of shame and and that I thought was so well captured in terms of understanding that this is a very difficult line that this character would balance he's not suddenly free he doesn't suddenly go and do things he suddenly starts taking part in um in group sex in a way that's really destructive to him and it, again those scenes start off with him seem, seeming to finally like shed himself of some of the shame and actually then it all comes crawling back in some of the most visceral ways and I, I just thought this was so well observed as a book and really clever as well as just being really deeply difficult to read at times and I, I really commend the author I think this is beautifully beautifully done um and uh, just is really written from the heart, I think, as well. Next up, and this is the sort of rare po part of the year where I'm mostly reading books either for pleasure or that I just need to give back to the library. And so there's no real prize kind of thing attached to it. Most of these also end up being books that I heard lots of people talking about in um, 2022 and are now sort of catching up on. And these next two are particular examples of that. The first being, I want to die, but I want to eat dog bokki, um by Bek Sehi um, and translated by Anton Herr. Um, and this is a book that is largely, I, for some reason, I think maybe because of the cover, I assumed this was a graphic novel. And I, I sort of, I picked up from the library, I'm like, oh, there are lots of words. <laughs> um, which, you know, is fine. Um, it's not like I'm, I'm, you know, against that, given everything else um, on this channel. But uh, it was sort of interesting, because actually it was in a completely different format to how I thought this book would look. And so a lot of this book is uh, passages of transcripts, basically, between uh, between Bexahi and her um, her therapist, or I think that we call it psychiatrist in the book, it's called. Um, and the interesting thing is, is sort of, yeah, watching uh, Bexahi really go through some of the, the, the sort of wrangle with some of the conversations um, around how she sees herself and a lot of her... A lot of the reasons she's going to the psychiatrist seems to be a lot around her sense of self-esteem, her sense of worth. Um, and so much of that is compounded by, you know, feelings of shame, but then sometimes feeling like she's this sort of main character almost and, and what have you. Um, and so it's really raw and and and, and difficult and, and sort of, you know, we, we are there in some really deep and intimate conversations. And then there are these these short passages after sort of little little segments where she will then talk about what she's done next or how she's 
um, how she's changing or, or what, what she's realised. I don't think I always found it fully successful. I think there was a lot where I thought I, I really commended this book for how raw it was. I think at times I also, I think I almost would have wanted a little bit less of the psychiatrist session and a little bit more of a kind of taking it the next step further. Because sometimes what happens is we get, you know, the psychiatrist saying certain things to her and then we get a very quick page that sometimes feels a little bit like a sort of spark notes or kind of very succinct version of it with also a sort of uh, some kind of thing that's going to change next that feels a bit like a platitude so sometimes for me I I felt a little bit like it was sort of you know the psychiatrist was saying you, you know here are some really big things to work on and she'd say yeah well you know I think I need to do this now and I'm like I'm not actually sure if that's what the psychiatrist said um but I think at the same time, you know, it's quite rare, I guess, that we get such an insight into somebody going through this process. Um, and although it was sometimes a bit difficult to uh, to sort of relate to or to kind of, uh, you know, sometimes I think I found some of the conversations a bit frustrating that they were having. Um, I guess that's also the point, right, that, it, that sort of having these conversations with a psychiatrist would be hard work. Um, and so they're not going to be these nice, easy, everything solved thing and I, I think it seems like you know from the reaction to the book a lot of people have found a lot in it that has been really valuable to them as well so I think it's really useful for that um that purpose even if I didn't always fully get on with with elements of it the next one which was a sort of buzzy book from last year is things have gotten worse since we last spoke by Eric LaRocca and I don't think I was prepared for what this book was. Again, I think I just heard it spoken about a lot. I knew it was very short. Um, I knew it was meant to be like this really kind of cool, exciting, edgy book. I don't think I realised it was kind of this form of edgy. And I, I'm really, I really loved it, even if it made me deeply uncomfortable in many, many ways. So the, the, the core the core idea of this is two people start talking on like a, an internet chat room. These two women. And... Um, it all starts because one of them wants to sell like an apple peeler that has been in the family for, for many, many years and they're selling it to, you know, she's selling it to make rent. Um, and somebody responds saying, hey, look, I couldn't possibly, I'm, I'm really interested in this thing. I couldn't possibly buy it from you knowing that this is a family heirloom and they have a bit of an email correspondence which then moves to the chat room. But then very quickly it becomes this very, different relationship because um the the second person um who was originally looking to buy the apple peeler pays for that person's pays for the first person's rent instead um and they don't really have names because they have sort of chat room names but there is sort of zoe and um uh, this is i think agnes um and so zoe is paying this money um and what then gets really quite complicated is it then turns into this sort of financial domination or sort of subdom or sadomasochistic or some kind of relationship um, that has this sort of power imbalance. And there's a contract that's signed to sort of confirm this. But that sort of dance of what this relationship is becomes really quite complicated because, for example, um, uh, Zoe is sort of seeing how far she can push her. And then she realises that Agnes has almost no limits and will do almost anything. Um, and that's the point where this book starts to break down, where there is something, and I don't want to spoil it, there is something that is so almost sort of beyond the pale or so unimaginable that is being asked that um, Zoe starts to become really worried about Agnes um, and sort of says, actually, I think we need to end it here. Like, I, I, I can't in good conscience continue this. But by this point Agnes is sort of like well no this is the the only way forward now I must continue this how dare you and it's so psychologically bizarre as a book it's an incredibly quick read because even though it's about 120 pages a lot of that is um in in the form of sort of chat rooms so actually there are lots of line breaks and you know whatever else and uh so you it reads incredibly quickly and is incredibly disturbing like this is yeah but I I was really quite impressed by how this book grapples with those ideas of what is so unspoken about and so beyond the pale and manages to kind of craft this really clever and compelling narrative out of it that's so messed up. <laughs> and I will be thinking about for a long time whether I want to or not. 
Um, so I actually really enjoyed it, but I, I can totally understand. I, I totally get why so many people have had such a negative reaction to it. I think this is an incredibly polarizing book because I think it is so deeply disturbing. Um, it's sort of a John Waters uh, like nightmare sort of scenario. It's really interesting for that, I think. Um, but yeah, that's that book. It's it's an experience. And last but not least, on a significantly cheerier and more charming note, uh, we have The Golden Mole by Catherine Rundell. Um, and so she uh, published two books last year, The, um, the Super Infinite, the book about John Donne and his life. And also this book, uh, which is a, a set of small, well, sort of short essays on various animals. And she basically digs out quite interesting facts about them. And so I realised at first this, this book sounds almost a bit more like a, a kid's book, or it maybe sounds a bit more like it's a, quite a lightweight book. But there's something so utterly charming and joyful about it. So, for example, she'll talk about wolves and she'll share some really interesting facts about wolves that you might not have known. Um, and then, but there's a there's a magic and there's a love to how she writes this, where there's a, a real understanding that you know, sort of, isn't nature wonderful? Isn't uh, you know, isn't it incredible that we have these creatures walking among us? And you know, there are birds, and we don't really understand anything about their lives, but they seem to operate in this really interesting way. Um, or, you know, like, you know, swallows um, sleeping, like having half their brain asleep at any point, and they never really stop and, and sit down, you know, they just keep flying. Um, and all of these other things to just sort of talk about these various animals. And it's so interesting. And um, I mean, I think this is sort of a book made for someone like me in, in some ways anyway, of just this very charming book that is about animals and stuff. Um, but I I just think it's a really it's a really charming book. I see as well why it was sort of a bit of a um, sort of stocking filler style book um, last year as well, even though I think it's incredibly substantial, more substantial than stocking filler seems to lend, lend it. But uh, yeah, a really interesting and fun book. And I just I, I had a great time with it. And that brings me to the end of all the books I've read this week, really. Um, a few interesting short books. Um, a very weird selection, really, in some ways. I mean, I suppose most of them were quite nice and interesting and charming books, but then you've got a lot of, like, death and destruction and sadomasochism and power balance, you know, power dynamics. What a, what a week. Um, so that's starting 2023 in an interesting light. Um, and, uh, yeah, just some interesting books nonetheless i hope you're having a good start to the year so far um i hope it's a little bit brighter and lighter there than it is currently in the uk um and uh, i'll speak to you all soon take care bye bye